to start recording. Okay, we are recording. All right. Okay. Welcome everyone to Farmers Markets Buying and sell Selling Cottage Foods. My name is Kelly Kunkel and I'm an extension educator in health and nutrition with the Department of Family Health and Wellbeing. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Cindy Hale. And Cindy Hale is a food safety extension educator with the University of Minnesota Extension Food Systems Program. And she develops food safety programming and provides education oh. across the state to empower all Minnesotans to engage fully in their local food system. Cindy has a PhD in ecosystems, ecology, and science education. And she is also the co-founder and owner of Clover Valley Farms, a highly diversified value-added <coughs> farming operation in Minnesota, Northeast Minnesota. I should have probably had a piece of paper. Somebody? Um, so if you are interested in having closed caption on your screen, you can find the closed caption or CC button at the bottom of your window, Zoom window. And depending upon your device, you may have to hover over the bottom of your screen. If you don't see the CC button, try looking for the button with the three dots and it will say more. And once you find the caption button, um, clicking on it toggles the captions on or off. As we As we get started, um, please put in the chat where you're joining from and what you're hoping to learn about this presentation in this presentation. So again, where you're joining from and what you hope to learn today. I'd like to also introduce our webinar producer, Lauren Backus. And Lauren is going to help us with any kind of technical issues that you might have. She'll help to monitor the chat and provide links to the chat. Questions will take place at the end of the, of, of the time today with Cindy. So if you would like to put your questions in the chat as you're thinking about them, just please do so and we'll get to those at the very end. All right. So I think I'm up, eh? Um, yes, but we're going to go back. Um, for the for the first poll, and Cindy's going to launch that first poll, and then you are up. I don't know how to launch that. Lauren's launching. <laughs> I got the poll. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. So we just kind of want to get some a sense of you know folks who are participating. How much do you, how often do you buy at a farmer's market? And, you know, that'll help us, you know, I, I want to talk to the people who are here, not the people I think are here. So it's nice to kind of know. Well, so it looks like a lot of you shop a few times a year. There's a few regulars, monthly, weekly, and then there's some that I've never bought. So I'm particularly going to work on you because I think you, once you try it, you might be hooked. So. Yeah, looks like things are stabilizing. Looks like we got all those. So we could end that poll maybe, Lauren. Yeah, and you can share the results so folks can see how the results came in. About 60% a few times a year, 20% monthly, 13% weekly. And that 7%, that we're going to get you to a farm market because we're going to get you so excited today. So, all right. All right. All right, so um, okay, I got to figure out how to advance my slide here. There we go. Is that me? Wait a minute. Okay, so that's the big question that we're going to start with. Why shop at a farmer's market? So um, I suspect that all of you went through a little thing called COVID a uh, couple of years back. Um, and that, if anything, should have convinced you that you want to support local food systems because when a catastrophe happens, you want to be able to get food. 
And if you don't have a local food system, you may, you're just much more vulnerable to not to not having access to safe and secure food. So definitely food security is a, is a huge issue. Um, you want, if you don't support a local food system, it's not gonna be there when you really, 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 really need it. But there's also lots of other great reasons, assuming we don't have any more catastrophes, to support local farm markets. The freshness of locally grown produce and fruits that you get at a farm market is unmatched. And along with that freshness, it's not just the flavor and the texture of the freshness, but the nutrient content of that fresh food is much higher. So it's a much more healthy alternative to you know, a tomato that's been shipped halfway across the world. Um, local food systems and farm markets support your local economy. Uh, it's you know, local foods and local economies, that's what provides us, you know, people who are local employed locally here, they spend their money in our local economy. So it's super important in terms of job opportunities and keeping money in our communities rather than giving it to a big corporation that takes it somewhere far, far away from we live, where we live. Um, it supports your community connection in all ways and shapes and forms. And it's just a, a really good way to provide for, um, help develop trusted sources of food. So, you know, a farmer who's standing there selling you their produce is gonna be happy to talk to you about how they produce that food. They may or may not be organically sustained or, or organic certified, but they're gonna be able to tell you, you know, do they spray? If they're raising animals, you know, how do they raise their animals? Is it humanely? Are they grass fed? You know, blah, 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 That's blah, blah, blah. But, you know, and another really important thing um, that I like about farmer's markets, it's really gets you connected and, and more in, scent, in tune with the changing of the seasons. You know, you can grow, you can buy strawberries at Cub Foods 12 months of the year. But you can't at a farmer's market. And that's because strawberries are really only fresh and really good and growing a certain time of the season. And so learning how to connect to your food eating to the seasonality is super important. And then of course, that's a big part of knowledge about your food system. What kinds of foods are available where and when, and how to cook them, uh, those kinds of things. So uh, Minnesota Grown is a, is a good source. Um, that Minnesota Grown's local foods link that's in the web in the on the slide is a good place to go for even more information on that. Okay. Doesn't seem to look like okay. Here we go. Another really good place to go. Like if there's one place you go to look for farmers markets, this is the place. The Minnesota Farmers Market Association. They do an extraordinarily good job of supporting and promoting. Minnesota farm. And I happen to know that the number 365 farmers markets is now 373 was the last count I got um, as of yesterday. So um, they're growing, they're all over and you can find, find uh, farmers markets where you live, but also if you're out playing, if you're traveling and doing your vacation, find a local farmers market. I think you're going to end up realizing it's a lot of fun, meet some really cool people and get some great food. Uh, you, the Minnesota Grown is also another way that you can find farmer's markets. Um, and the Minnesota Grown also has some, of, some really nice resources on what kinds of things you can look for at different times of the season. And these are kind of, these are some things that are really gonna be available in the spring. In the spring, you're gonna see a lot of uh, fresh greens, microgreens. They also have this new Living Local uh, magazine thing that you can sign up for. Uh, it's also available online if you wanna view it online. It's got some really wonderful information um, that you might, and it's seasonally, it's produced seasonally. So it really helps you kind of focus in on what you can hope to find and it has, has recipes and other kinds of things. This is also things, things that you can find on the Minnesota Grown website in terms of kind of charts of what kinds of fruits and vegetables 
um, you can find, expect to find over the different seasons at different farm markets. Microgreens are, are often a really popular thing this time of year. I like microgreens all the time, but I especially like them in the spring because we're all just craving those fresh green vegetables. Our blood needs it, our body needs it, our brain needs it. So microgreens are a really nice way to get there. So you'll see produce in May and June, asparagus, bedding plants, green onions, radish, rhubarb, spinach, um, scallions are also there. Uh, other things that you know aren't necessarily fruits and vegetables that you'll find at farmers markets. Fresh herbs uh, are often at, at the early spring markets. Eggs, local meats, cheese, maple syrup, honey, cut flowers, and then cottage food. Um, that's kind of a segue. So cottage food is something you're going to see at our markets often, and especially in the spring when there aren't as, as many um, produce vendors there. So so what the heck is cottage food? This is where Lauren's going to put up another poll because we want to we want to test you. What do you know? What do you not know? So if you want to just respond to, uh, oh, 36 mm percent. -hmm. Never heard of cottage. OK, that's going down. I love to see the little bar bouncing back and forth as people are putting in their in their um, things. Okay, so starting to get a little more stable, maybe 46% plus or minus have bought from a cottage food producer, but there's not many that are regular uh, cottage food customers. So we want to totally want to bump that up. You're a cottage food producer yourself, 16%, really nice. I've heard the name, but I don't really know what it means. And I've heard of cod, and I've never heard of cottage food before. That's almost 40% of the people here today. So you're the target, you're my target market today. You're the folks I really wanna to talk to so that we can, we can really help you understand what cottage foods are, um, what role they play in our local food system and why you should really seriously think about becoming a cottage food customer because they're it's a great, great way to get, get really wonderful food. Okay. Sometimes my forward button works and sometimes it doesn't. So the Minnesota cottage food laws were first passed in 2015 and they allow for what is certain called non-potentially hazardous food, which is a big legally kind of word. I'll get to what that means. Um, but the biggest thing is that it allows a producer to make specific products in their home kitchen and then sell them directly to the consumers without a license. So it, it, in, it allows for, especially in rural communities and small communities, it really allows folks to do the kinds of uh, home cooking that you, you know, grandma and grandpa used to do um, and sell to in, within your local community, these non-potentially hazardous foods. And I'll get to what, non-potentially hazardous foods mean in a minute. Turns out there's a lot of things. So in 2021, uh, the Minnesota cottage food law got updated uh, and two things that happened. So there are two levels of registration and I'll talk about that in a little bit. A tier one, so under the cottage food registration, um, you can, tier one, you can earn up to $7,665 in sales. So it's not profits, it's sales. Uh, but tier two registration, which involves a little bit of a, a extra training, you can earn up to $78,000 annually. Um, now that's real money. So if you want to have a side gig or maybe you want to explore building your own uh, food processing manufacturing business, um, that's real money. Uh, and also what happened in 2021 is pet treats were added. So now uh, pet treats are allowed to be made and sold under the cottage food law. So cottage food has really been a, an incredible boon to helping expand the local food economy. It allows you to make it in your, in your home kitchen. Now, does anybody here really have a kitchen that clean? I looked for a real kitchen picture on the internet and I couldn't find any. And I didn't want to put a picture of my kitchen on there. But if you have a kitchen that clean, good for you. Um, <laughs> 
um, so it allows you to make things in your own kitchen. Um, and it may, allows you to make what are classed as non-potentially hazardous foods. And it allows you to sell them directly to consumers in Minnesota. You can't sell your food, your cottage food in, that's made in Minnesota in Wisconsin, or North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, because they have their own laws. So the cottage food laws right now are state re regulated. If you live on a border city, and this is something that you really want to do, you can sometimes become a registered cottage food producer in that other state. But for now, if you're a Minnesota cottage food producer, you sell directly to consumers in Minnesota. So the first thing, get out, get this off the off the is what things are not allowed under cottage food. So things that have inherent uh, potential hazards if they're not properly refrigerated, frozen, or handled. Um, so uh, dairy products. So for example, you can't you you can't make your own homemade cheese in your kitchen, in your home kitchen, and sell it as a cottage food. Yes, you can use butter in your baked goods, but you can't make cheese or other kind of dairy products. Uh, eggs, again, you, you can use eggs in baked goods, but you can't make things like pickled eggs or deviled eggs because those are inherently potentially dangerous if they're not handled and stored and transported in the correct temperatures and things like that. And then all kinds of, any kinds of meat, poultry, seafood. Um, you can't, uh, these are, this is the, this is the icky can't slide. Um, soon to come will be the, the more fun. What things you can do slide. Um, so you can't sell across state lines, like I mentioned, um, because the Minnesota laws just apply to Minnesota. You can't sell wholesale. So you can't sell your cottage food, jams and jellies to a gift shop, and then they're gonna sell them for you. That, you can't do that. You need to sell and deliver to the end consumer. So um, you can do that by having them pick it up at your house. You can deliver it directly to them. You can sell at farmer's markets or certain community events. So there are lots of different ways in which you can take orders and deliver it to a customer. But the, the basic idea is that you're selling to the end consumer. So in its broadest sense, a non-potentially hazardous food is one that does not support the rapid growth of illness-causing microorganisms. Uh, that's the ugly things I'm gonna make, okay. And, and basically they don't require time or temperature safety control. So there are things that are shelf stable at room temperature. So that canned jar of salsa, the canned jams and jellies, uh, baked goods that can sit out on your counter for a few days. Um, that aren't gonna make people sick. Can you think of a baked good that you would not want to set out on your kitchen counter for a couple of days? Anybody? Anybody? Cheesecake, cheesecake, that's a no-no. How about carrot cake with cream cheese frosting? Those are things you instinctively would put in your refrigerator. So those are also the kinds of things that are Although they're baked goods, they're not allowed under the cottage food laws. And then canned things need to be acidic, either naturally like tomatoes or limes, lemons, apples, tart cherries, um, or they contain a high amount of sugar. So like jams and jellies have a lot of sugar in them. That sugar binds up the water and that's what makes them shelf stable at room temperatures. And then you can also add acidity called pickling, you can pickle just about anything. And by pickling fruits, vegetables, herbs, you make them food safe, non-potentially hazardous, and you can sell them through cottage food. So here's some a list of some examples of non-potentially hazardous foods. So acidic, naturally acidic food, acidified foods um, that are home canned and home processed. So fruits, vegetables, pickles, or fermented, Vinegars, condiments, sauces, salsas, baked goods, like I said, with some limits, no cream cheese frostings or cheese, cheese like baked goods. Uh, lots of different kinds of beverages, candies, confections, dried, dehydrated, and roasted, uh, icings, frostings, sugar art, toppings, jams, jellies, preserves, fruit, butters, syrups. 
and so uh, just to kind of get it, you can make cakes, that's a baked good, um, and you can actually, under the cottage food, you can put whole fruits. So if you want to decorate that cake with whole berries, fruit, you know, strawberries or blueberries or raspberries, you can do that, but you can't cut those. And the reason for that is that the act of cutting those fruits actually opens that up and it can lead to contamination from those microorganisms that can cause the food to go off. Um, and so whole fruits are allowed as decoration on, on candies and baked goods, but not cut fruits. So we have this, uh, myself and my partner in crime here in food safety, uh, put together this little cottage food training fact sheet. It just has uh, a, a brief description of the tier, uh, and Lauren, oh, is there a question? No, nope, but I, I just threw your PDF in the chat, so everybody should have access to it. So this PDF um, is in the chat. You should be able to download it by just clicking on a link in the chat. Um, and the second page is probably the most important of this PDF because it lists some of the key organizations that you're going to want to know about um, who are going to have a lot of great information to help support you. Number one is the Minnesota Farm Market Association, as I mentioned them before. Uh, and the other is the Minnesota Cottage Food Producers Association. And I'll introduce you to them again in a, a couple of additional slides. Um, this handout is also available in Spanish and Hmong. So if you have, if anybody in, I don't know if you put all of them up, Lauren, or? I put at least two of them. I have the one in Spanish and the one in English. Okay, if anybody out there would like it in Hmong, please, um, or maybe just put the Hmong version up as well. Um, you can always contact me. So there's my email, c-m-h-a-l-e at u-m-n dot e-d-u. You can put me in your contacts. So if you ever have a question or you like, I want that handout, and I didn't get the link, just shoot me an email and I'll make sure to get it, um, get it to you. And if there are other translations that you are interested in or communities that you work with are interested in, please let us know. We're really actively doing uh, gathering information about what different community needs are out there and translations is a big, big uh, part of what we wanna make. We wanna be able to make all of this stuff much more accessible to everybody in the food system. Okay, so, what, there are two different kinds of food trainings that you need to take if you're going to be doing uh, become a cottage food uh, producer. One is that tier one training. Uh, it's free, which is often if you've never been a cottage food producer before, that's often where people start. It's free. Um, you go. You can go and register at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture registration. Um, and the, the training is literally a PDF. So you download this slideshow that they put together and you read through it. And that in that PDF, it goes through all of the important parts of the law, what things you need to know about what is allowed, what is not, labels, all those things. And in that PDF, they have little quizzes. After the quiz, they give you the right answer. And the reason for that is that we're not grading you, but we want you to know the right answers. So um, by reading through that PDF, that is, the, that is the training of your tier one registration. Um, and then on the form, you just check a little box that says, oh yeah, I read that, I went through that, um, and you, you get registered. So again, the tier one training, there is a sales cap of $7,665. So if you know you're going to sell way more than that this year, then I'd encourage you to in, sign up for the tier two trainings. Um, but if you don't know and you're just starting, you can always start at tier one. And then if you end up going over that $7,665 sales cap, you can always trans convert into the tier two training. So the tier two training, this is where I become relevant <laughs> in this whole thing. Um, the Mi University of Minnesota Extension provides the training for the tier two cottage food producers. It's an online training, it's self-paced. 
Uh, it's about takes about four hours to complete, and it goes into much more detail on all of the various elements of the cottage food laws, what's allowed, what's not allowed, that kind of thing. Um, so that's how I become relevant here. <laughs> so, and one of the things that both trainings will discuss are what are some what we what are referred to in food safety lingo as critical controls for safe cottage food products. So there are two ways that your product can be made non potentially hazardous. Either it has a pH value of 4.6 or lower, so it's naturally acidic or it's been acidified by adding vinegar or lemon juice or something that makes it more acidic. Or it has a high, a low uh, water activity that AW is a fancy scientific term for water activity of 0 .0, uh, 0 0.85 or less. That means nothing to you uh, <laughs> because you probably aren't steeped in what water activity means. Um, but basically what that means is it's gonna be a product that's dry um, like baked goods, crackers, cookies, or the water is bound up by something like sugar or pectin or salt. So jams and jellies, even though they have kind of a liquidy texture, that sugar is largely, the sugar largely binds up that water. And so it has what's called a low water activity. So that water isn't just free, able to float around and run around looking for things to get in trouble with, it's locked up. Um, so your cottage food products are going to have to meet one of those, not both, either low pH or uh, low water activity. And then of course, both of the trainings go through what are good food handling pro uh, practices, uh, making sure your kitchen is clean and sanitized, and especially looking at how to prevent cross-contamination, um, especially when it comes to allergens. You know, there are lots of allergens, I'll talk about them in a minute. Um, but things like peanuts, some people can be very, 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 very allergic to peanuts. So if you cook with peanuts, even though peanuts might, might not be in your product, you might wanna put on your label, made in a kitchen that uses peanuts. Because we want, the goal is to teach you as a cottage food producer how to bake a food that is safe for your customers. Because that's all, that's the, in the end, we want to keep all of our customers safe and happy and healthy. So this is a little, a little uh, uh, just infographic of what kinds of things, what does this pH scale mean? Uh, the lower the number, the more acidic that the product is. And you can see things like coffee tend to be a little too high, milk is too high, water, and then distilled water is seven. Um, what low acidity means is you see down here and it's got this pH equals negative log H plus. That's again, science lingo. Basically an acidic product has lots of these little hydrogen, H is hydrogen. These hydrogen atoms floating around in the liquid that have this positive charge. And by being in a liquid at a high enough uh, level, um, they can actually, they'll, they'll kind of attack all the little bacteria and microbes that might wanna grow there and say, nope, you're not gonna grow here. So um, that's why that low pH is a really critical factor for canned fruits or veggies or things that you're making that are gonna be made food safe by pH. And most things that you're gonna can, like so you wanna make apple cider. So apple cider is naturally acidic, but because it's getting ground up um, when in the, mic, in the grinding process and that can mix in bacteria and molds and other kinds of things, so most acidic and acidified products also require canning in order to kill any bacteria spores that are present in that product. And then it also creates, the canning process creates an airtight seal 
to basically prevent recontamination. That's what makes that product shelf stable, what we call shelf stable, why it can sit on your cupboard in your pantry unrefrigerated for months. But when you open it, then you want to put it in the refrigerator because all of a sudden now it's been open to air again. Does that make sense? I know these, I don't, it's hard to get feedback on this stuff, but if you have any questions or like, wait a minute, what about this? Type them to Lauren and she's going to tell me about them. This is a little, a uh, little, little bit of an intro to what is water activity. So water activity, again, there's sciency images up there, but basically it refers to the amount of available water. So a fresh strawberry on average has about 92% of its water that's kind of free and ready to go. It can evaporate out of the berry. And if that water can move in and out of the food, then that water is what's called available and it can be glommed onto by a bacteria or a fungus or a mold. And that would allow for that organ, that illness causing uh, bug to grow. And so making jams and jellies, you're adding pectin or some kind of gelling agent and lots of sugar. Um, and those things, adding the sugar and adding the pectin basically bind up that water. So now that water doesn't just move in and out of that food product really easily anymore. It kind of stays locked in that food product. And then the cooking and processing of those food products, again, kills any live bacteria molds or their spores. So the cooking process is equally as important as the level of water. Um, and that's why if you're using baked, so baked goods are, you know, made safe by water activity. Um, and that's why it's important that if you're going to make baked goods that you package them properly so that you limit the amount of rapid rehydration. If you leave a cookie out unpackaged, it starts to absorb moisture in the air. Same with loaves of bread, whatever. Um, and or crackers, that's what makes them stale or get mushy, is they're, they're absorbing moisture from the air. So proper packaging is important so that you don't get rapid rehydration of that product and recontamination of it uh, with the bacteria and mold and spores after you've gone to all the effort of making it food safe by cooking it. Okay, and I'm going quick here because I wanna to get to the questions. Um, so, as a cottage food producer, there are a, a few musts. Musts are things that the law says you have to do in terms of labeling. There's some other shoulds, coulds, but I'm going to cover the musts. So the things that you must do if you're a cottage food producer on your label and so, uh, uh, on your label, you need to have your name and then either your registration number, and that's what will come on your cottage food card, or your address. Now, for lots of reasons, there are some people who are just not gonna wanna put their address on their label, so you don't have to. You can if you choose to, you don't have to. But you do need to have, if you're not gonna put your address, put your registration number. One other thing that you must have on that label is the date the food was prepared for sale. So, if you can something, you're going to put the date that it was canned. So, um, if you are baking, so sometimes like cookie makers, you might make a big batch of dough or frosting and then put that in the freezer. And at some future date, you bring that out and you chop it up and you put it on cookie sheets and you cook it and then you take it out and you frost it. That's the date you would put on that baked good. Is the day you make it and package it for sale. Does that make sense? Just to try to give some clarity on that. And calling it batch or date made on, either way, just so customers understand that that's the date that that product was made and packaged for sale. And then really important that you have a list of all the ingredients in descending order. So the most abundant product goes first. 
uh, in descending order. And it's also important to include sub ingredients. So in my Cindy super fancy hot sauce, I found this spice mix that I really like and it's got cumin, coriander and salt in it. So I'm gonna put spices and then in parentheses what those sub ingredients are. And then it's super important that you put uh, some statement of, 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 um, of uh, allergens. And actually there are no soy or sesame allergens in my food. Um, so I could just say made in a kitchen using soy sesame. You're not required to put that verbiage on your label only required to list an allergen if it's actually an ingredient, but it never hurts. And the in allergens that you need to, in, to list and call out specifically are eggs. So if you use eggs, milk in your baked goods, that's an allergen. So then you need to have contains milk, eggs, even though it says it in the ingredient, it says egg in the ingredient list, says milk in the ingredient list, you still want to call that out as an allergen. Contains egg, milk. If it contains wheat, um, tree nuts, peanuts, soy, shellfish, fish, and then uh, it was just last year, sesame got added as a, a federally listed allergen. So and that's a really important one because sesame comes in lots of different names. It, uh, different ethnic groups use set called sesame different things. So it's really important that you know whether or not you're using something that is a sesame product. And then last but not least, the, the law does require that you put this statement, exactly less statement. These products are homemade and not subject to state inspection on your label. It doesn't have to be as big and prominent as that one is, but it can't be super tiny either. So it needs to be in a font that is readable on your, on your label. Um, and then this particular verbiage, these products are homemade and not subject to state inspection is also required to be on any signage that you have that you're selling at a farmer's market. You need to have a little sign that says these products are homemade and not subject to state inspection. If you're taking orders online, which you certainly can do as a cottage food producer, you also need to have that statement on your website. These products are homemade and not subject to state inspection. So those were the, these are the things you have to have based on the law on your label. But there's a lot of other things you might want to have on your label. So I put my logo. I put the name of my Cindy Super Fabulous Hot Sauce. Um, and one thing I do, um, just because it's in, it is important that you have records. Of, so if you're making something like a sauce that's made non-potentially hazardous by virtue of its pH, you are required to have that information with you when you're selling that product in case the Department of Agriculture decides to show up at that farm market and they want to know, well, prove to me that this is legal. Um, I'm not that organized and I'm not going to have my recipe and my canning records with me at a farmer's market. So what I do is I put the pH on the label of my products. And that comes from a measurement that I make in my own kitchen. So that's something I did because I wanted to be in compliance with the law and I knew I would never remember to bring my canning records with me every time I go to a farmer's market. But one thing I found that was super interesting is customers like it. They comment about it. It, it, it engages them. They're like, oh, you have the pH here. What's that about? And it engages them and I get to have a conversation with them about pH and how pH is important in terms of keeping your food safe. And that's why vinegar is in every salsa recipe you've ever seen because it's lowering the pH. Um, so it's a I think it's really cool 
that you can use some of these regulated things on your label to engage your customer in a really proactive way and show them that you're, you take this serious. You know, even though you're not inspected, you take food safety really seriously. And some things you cannot do on labels are nutrition, nutritional claims like this will clear, this will make your memory great. It'll fix the wrinkles on your skin, um, things like that. So just stay away from any kind of health nutrition uh, claims. Okay, so we've got a couple, we've got another. So that was a quick and dirty. I'm wondering if anybody was super impressed by this and now are more likely to be going to a farmer's market? Oh my goodness. Are you less likely? Probably not gonna change. Yeah, I do, do you know how to find a farmer's market now? This is, and I'll, you can, and you can check all of these, I think. Are they all, or are they limited, Lauren? I think they can check any of them. I can't check the setting. Okay. Oh yeah, multiple choice, there it is, yep. Yeah, so select all that apply, should be able to. So do you know how to find a farmer's market? Will you start shopping at a farmer's market? Okay, cool. So 7% said they had never shopped at a farmer's market. And now 7% say they are gonna start to shop. If you're the same people, yay. I achieved one of my objectives for today. Planning on increasing. Awesome. So good job. Um, I'm super thrilled that in this little amount of time, I, I seem to have communicated some important things. That's my goal. And that's why we do these polls because, you know, I need to get feedback. if I'm doing something really, really well or really bad. All right, let's move on here. Okay, where's my next? Next. Next. Okay. So I saw there was an initial question on how do I get registered as a cottage food producer? This is where you go. It's the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Cottage Food Registration. Um, there is a downloadable version in Spanish of both the application, the registration form, and the training. So that's really awesome. We're working now with the MDA to try to start doing something in Hmong. Um, and we're also really interested in translating it into other languages. So again, reach out to me if you have any particular requests. We're really interested in making sure everybody has access to this great thing. Um, and right there, you can see on the website where you click to register. Um, and then down a little bit, there's, a, there's another one to... Um, uh, download the PDF that is the tier one training. Okay. And this is a, this happy looking group of folks um, are a subset of the Minnesota Registered Cottage Food Producers Association. They have a website and they also have a really great Facebook page. They're a wonderful group of people who are very enthusiastic and passionate about cottage food. If you have questions about recipes or ingredients or processing methods, labeling, they do workshops on labeling. They do workshops on pricing your product. They're a super fabulous resource. Um, if you are a cottage food producer and wanna learn more, or if you wanna get started in cottage food producing, I think you, you should definitely reach out to them. They're great, great folks. Oops. And Okay, now we get a final Zoom poll, right, Lauren? Do we have a final Zoom poll? We should, but it's not letting me launch it. Oh, okay. Well, in the meantime, well, we'll... <laughs> while, while Lauren is doing that, you've had some questions come in. So maybe I can share those. Fire, um, fire can, away. How can you bake goods online with cottage food license and deliver it? You to the producer, to the purchaser, or do they have to pick it up from your house? So yes, you can take the orders online and you can deliver, They, you have your choice of how you deliver it to them. They can come pick it up at your house or you can deliver it to them. You can deliver it to them personally, or you can deliver it to them at a farmer's market or a special community event. 
What you can't do is ship that product. So that's the one thing that is not yet allowed under cottage food. So you can take orders online. A lot of people do. Um, you can have them pick it up at your place, or you can coordinate a drop-off or a delivery. Um, did that answer that question? Do you like I answered that question? Sounds like, that. <laughs> Sounds like that answered the question. There was also a question about um, dried meat and dehydrated meat. And our friend from the Farmers Market Association, Kathy Zeman, answered that and said, no, that is no. still not something. Yeah, meat, meats, just meats in general, any form of meat, meat as an ingredient, any kind of dried meat, meats not, not, not happening under cottage food. Who knows? Maybe someday we'll get to a point where the food safety kind of procedures get to a point that, that we can make that. But right now, no, nothing meat. Very good. And Kathy did add, Kathy Zeman added from the Minnesota Farmers Market Association, the link to the um, resource page for how to sell a farmer's market um, at farmer's markets. So, so thank you. Oh, Kathy. yes. Yes. And I, I realize now I mentioned the Minnesota Farmers Market at the beginning, but yes, absolutely. The Minnesota Farmers Market Association and Kathy in particular uh, are work tirelessly to develop resources and supports to help people sell at farmer's markets. So definitely the Minnesota Farm Market Association and the Minnesota Cottage Food Association, those are the two organizations that you definitely wanna connect with. There's tons and tons of resources for you as a consumer and as a potential vendor. Thank you. A question from Linda, is frozen pizza allowed to be sold under the cottage food license? No, unless you're doing a cheeseless pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I'm and getting meat, I'm guessing meatless too. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, here's the poll. Um, yep, so I just go fixed ahead it. And, <laughs> so you guys go ahead and start filling out this poll, and I'll talk about frozen pizza. So, you, you, the product that you make again has to be shelf stable at room temperatures. So you, if it requires freezing or refrigeration in order to keep it food safe, like would you carry that pizza around uncooked and leave it on your kitchen counter for a day? Of course not. Why? Because you're going to get really sick if you eat that thing, even if you cook it afterwards. So things like cheese, meat, and uncooked or unprocessed vegetables, anything that's chopped, you know, so like I said, you can do whole fruits on a cake, but you can't do chopped fruit because the process of chopping really adds the risk of contamination. And so anything that's chopped or cut needs to be processed um, or fermented before it, before it can be sold as cottage food. Did I feel like I answered that question? Okay. All right, so you learned a lot about cottage food, yay. More likely to buy cottage food, yay. I don't expect my cottage food to change, but there are a lot of you who are already buying regularly. I'm feeling confident about all the safety of cottage food products. Yay, that's what's really important to me as the food safety educator. I want people to know that cottage food producers are, they, they are going through training. They are learning how to do safe foods and that, you should engage them in that conversation and find out exactly what they're doing. And you might be surprised they're doing, they're very interested in making sure that you have a safe product. Thank so you. Um, Kathy gave us an update. Um, Zeman gave us uh, an update now, from this legislative session as of July 1, not until July 1 of 2023, pet treats made under the cottage food um, law can be shipped. So that's something oh, to be something. Thank you, Kathy. Some things change. So. <laughs> I knew the I knew the law had changed, but I didn't know what the deployment date was. So because this is hot off the presses. So you guys are lucky that Kathy happened to come to this presentation and can give you that hot off the press. So as of July 1, pet treats and pet treats alone can be sold, can be shipped as cottage food producers. So that's cool, step in the right direction. And you know, that's another thing I just gotta say, the Minnesota Farm Market Association and the Minnesota 
Cottage Food Producers Association, they're the ones who are out there working with legislators and figuring out how to build this local food system so that as many people are as involved as possible. So thanks, thank them, give them a little, yay! Thanks for your work. Absolutely. More questions. So, I'll, yes. I'll keep asking questions till we run yeah, out of Nancy time. Nancy asks, does it make any difference um, if uh, you have a tier, oops, I won't. A tier one or tier two. Um, so it doesn't make a difference if you have a tier one or tier two, you can't sell in a store. Correct. Yeah. There you cannot sell in a store, even if you own the store. So you own a gift shop and you're a cottage food producer. You still can't sell in a retail store. Um, and you can't sell your products to like a coffee shop who's then going to resell them. So you you must sell your product directly to the end consumer. Um, you can't sell it through another party. Does that make sense? So Star asks, can I put cut fresh fruit into a recipe and bake it? Yes, you can. Yes, because it's cooked. That's the key piece there. So if you're wanting to use a cut a fruit as a decoration that's not going to be cooked, has to be whole. But if you're if you're baking it in your product, then yes, you can have it cut mm -hmm. because um, the cooking process helps deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer asks, how do I know which spices to list on my spice label and which ones I can just list in spices? So if it is an allergen or a suspected allergen, it must be listed explicitly. But I am of the mind that the more, the more clarity you give to your customer, the better. Um, uh, M MSG is not, menosodium glutamate, it's not a, re a reportable allergen. But I know lots of people who are very allergic to monosodium glutamate. And that's often a kind of mystery ingredient that's in spice packets. So if you're going to use a pre-made or pre-purchased spice packet, I think it's on you to make sure that you know what those ingredients are and whether or not, um, and, and that if you put those sub ingredients on the label, then somebody who is allergic to something that's not a listed allergen, they can see, oh, I can't eat this because I'm allergic to MSG or I am gluten intolerant. So I can't, even though technically oat isn't wheat, unless it's a gluten-free oat, it's almost always contaminated with gluten. So, you know, so the more clarity, the more complete your ingredient list on your label is, the better. Thank you, Cindy. Um, mm -hmm. Keep bring, putting your questions in the chat while you're doing that. We're just gonna wrap up a few other things. Um, if I can move the slide, there we go. Um, Lauren is going to put the evaluation into the chat. This is very important, especially if you want well-being points for insurance. You want to make sure that you fill this out. And the first question is going to ask what webinar series you attended. Go down to the very last entry and it's what's for dinner. And then when you click on that, then you can find the, the webinar with the date of the 25th on Cottage Foods. So you want to make sure that you complete the evaluation and we'll put that also in the follow-up email. You will be getting a follow-up email. When the series is completed, you'll also get the recording of all of the, re the recordings for the webinars in that series. Don't forget to sign up for the webinars. Um, there's nine different series, 31 webinars through extension, all are free. If you find that it's a time that doesn't work for your schedule, sign up anyway. And as I said, at the end of the series, you'll get the recording and you can watch it then. Engage with us on Facebook and Twitter and Inst Instagram and Pinterest and others. So please make that connection with us. Um, these are all of the credits that Cindy has shared to make her um, webinar and some resources for you. And back to some questions. Um, yeah. Pat provided us with a, a kind of an update about allowable, what's allowed for shipping those pet treats. Uh, Jennifer asked, what license do I need to sell in a store? 
So if you want to sell something in a grocery store or a coffee shop, you would need to have a license and you would also need to, you would need to make that product in a, a facility in which you hold a license. So it has to be a commercial grade. You can't do, unless you have a commercial grade kit. No, no, even if you have a commercial grade kitchen in your home, that you use, if you use it for your personal food, you can't use it to make licensed food. So the next step to be able to, to wholesale is you need to be in a facility where you hold a license to produce that food that meets the sanitary commercial grade requirements. Um, you can never use your home kitchen or a kitchen in which you do home personal preparation in, for license. So it's a separate facility if you want to know more about that, uh, it, uh, Lauren, if you want to share my email in the chat again, um, please do reach out to me. I'm happy to kind of walk you through the potential uh, steps to do that. The nature of what license you need and what kind of circumstances you need in a kitchen will vary depending on what kind of food you're trying to make and then wholesale. So. There's no blanket. You're going to need this, that, or the other thing. It really depends on the specific kind of food you want to make. So if you want to follow that up, you know, shoot me an email and I'd be happy to help you kind of talk you through what those potential steps would be. Yep. Thank you, Cindy. A lot of thank yous. Uh, this has been so interesting. Um, your email is in there. The evaluation, again, take a moment to fill out that evaluation, especially if you want those well, wellness points. And yeah, no, thank yous, thank yous again. So I'm not seeing any que other questions. Lauren, did, were there any other questions that you saw? Um, I think the one that was a direct message was already posted again and already answered. So I think we're all, all good on my end. Very good. Hey. Thank you again well, so much. Yeah, I'm really thankful. Great, thank I mean, we had 49, I think at the max. So we had a good group show up, which is awesome. And thank you. And I'm glad I was able to be here and share all this with people. So yeah. I'll stick around till the last person leaves if there's any last minute question. That's good. I think we can stop the recording. Okay. Okay.